Welcome back to the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. Today I am chatting with Melody from on Instagram at renaissance.woman.mn for Minnesota. She and I are going to chat about winter, enjoying winter, what we're cooking in winter. Melody is a really interesting person, I have found out. She hunts, she carves, she teaches her kids chess and all kinds of really cool things. Make sure to stay all the way to the end of this episode because at the end of this episode, she really lays out some beautiful wisdom and why winter is such an enjoyable time and should not be taken for granted. It is an episode just full of all the things that make winter really beautiful that are easy to overlook whenever it's just so cold going outside. And she's from Minnesota, so if anybody can enjoy the winter whenever there is snow constantly on the ground, negative temperatures often, then it is Melody. And I, after talking to her, realized that I picked the perfect guest for this episode because she just has a lot of wisdom to share and the episode just kept getting better and better in my opinion. My name is Lisa, mother of seven and creator of the blog and YouTube channel, Farmhouse on Boone. Join me as I share with you my love for creating a handmade home from scratch cooking and a little mom and entrepreneur life along the way. I wanted to have the kind of episode that is talking about getting people through winter, embracing winter. Winter is such a challenging time. I feel like it's difficult to actually enjoy it. You seem like you might actually actually enjoy it. Maybe I'm wrong, but some of the sports that you enjoy, winter. I'm like, I think she actually likes winter. So she's going to be a good one for this. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. not just, it's not just the weather. I mean, I do, I live in Minnesota because I love it. You know, I wouldn't, I would not survive in a place like Florida. Like I love the weather here, Yeah, but it's also just that in the winter, there's so much less demand on my time and I can slow mm-hmm. things down and we can just kind of, it's like a restart, you know, it's like a fresh start to going into the next growing season and preserving season. And, you know, everything's more busy. It's when we work on the homestead, it's when we do all this and that. And are still trying to get weekends to go to our cabin and go fishing and things like that. You know, there's just, there's so many demands in the summer and spring and the fall. So winter is such a great respite from all of that. It is, especially, yeah, like you said, when you're homesteading, the summer months and the spring months are packed. Now, you like to do things like hunting, which if you live down in Florida, I don't really know. I don't know. Do they, do they hunt down in Florida? How do you hang the deer out? Yeah, they have a I mean, there is. There is a lot of good hunting in Florida. They have good whitetail, okay. hog hunting, you know, alligators, all that. I mean, I'm never going to hunt an alligator in Minnesota, so. <laughs> but um, yeah, <laughs> they do. True. They just have to. They have to cool it. I have some friends who hunt whitetail down there, and they have to cool it really fast because you know, yeah, spoilage. So now, are you? A, you're a homeschool mom too, correct? Yep. Yeah, I have. So I have four in school right now. And then I have my three-year-old is the youngest. And um, today it was so funny. My son, my eight-year-old son was doing his reading out loud and she was sitting next to me and she, over my shoulder, read one of the words that he was struggling with and corrected him. The three-year-old? Yeah. (laughs) Wow. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) We're a little bit behind that, but my I looked at your page and four of yours are girls and one's a boy. I don't know. With my kids, the girls were so much easier on things like reading. And then I have five boys and I don't know about the younger boys, but I promise you my four-year-old is nowhere near reading. (laughs) Not even close. But they just, that's like the the biggest gift of homeschooling is that nobody has to be on a schedule, you know? Like my son, he did not seem ready for reading. Um, And so I just didn't do it with him. And like, I learned this when my oldest was young because, you know, I started with her when she was four because I just thought that's what everybody did. Right. Mm -hmm. And then it was like, we're beating our head against a wall for three years, not making much progress and stressing her out and stressing me out. And one mom at that point, uh, one of my mentors told me was like, just stop. She'll know how to read by the time she's married. I mean, she's not going to walk down the aisle not knowing (laughs) how to read. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I mean, what's my hurry? So I didn't start teaching him until last year when he was almost seven. He didn't Mm -hmm. even know the ABCs then. 
And then um, within two months, he was reading. You know, I so feel like we like, could do a whole homeschool podcast episode because this is something that people seriously need to hear because of that. I've learned that too now with seven kids, but I did the same thing as you with my oldest. We tried reading seriously at age three. <laughs> like that's when we started. And looking back now, I'm I'm like, what were we even thinking? They all end up reading. They By the time they're married, like you said, they're all going to be just fine. So there's no sense. Well, in and I mean, hopefully before that, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, you know, but I just, yeah, it's just such a great, great thing to release yourself from being on other people's standards and just kind of upkeeping whatever your child's need is, you know, cause like homeschooling shouldn't look like public school where everybody has to fit in the same box. Like it gets to, yeah, be I didn't to homeschool to public school at home. That's yeah. Exactly yeah. Right. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> Well, and that leads into some of the skills that I noticed on your page that you like to do, especially several of them really do lend themselves well to winter. But those kind of things are what I find that my kids are learning as homeschool kids, things that you don't learn in school. So, you know, kitchen skills, I'm sure you get your kids in the kitchen a lot. I saw that you have kind of a small kitchen waiting on a renovation. <laughs> But you can still yeah. get them all in there and it doesn't take a lot. Well, we just do it one at, one at a time. And right. um, so today, for example, uh, my nine-year-old daughter made breakfast. She made oatmeal with uh, poached eggs. And then wow. for lunch, my daughter, well, for like brunch, my daughter, older daughter made two loaves of banana bread from scratch with the only thing I helped her with was reaching the ingredients she couldn't reach because yeah, I'm five foot ten, and I have a small kitchen, so everything is really oh, high. <laughs> yeah, so nobody can reach anything. <laughs> but um, other than that, she did everything from scratch. And those skills, like, I don't know, those skills are so important. So I like it too for creativity. I, a lot of times, will just let my kids run loose in the kitchen and just start adding things. The other day, my daughter did a soup, which soup is always on right now. That is how we get through winter. Is with pots of soup. So she was putting in, I think she did ground sausage. She added in some tomato paste, chopped up several different kinds of veggies, homemade bone broth, threw in some barley. No, no, she didn't throw in barley. She threw in some einkorn noodles. But I love that creativity that you get to explore with your kids. I like having, like you said, not a very packed schedule. So there's a lot of time for things like that, just to mm-hmm. get your hands dirty Give and try them. something. Yeah, to give them some life skill and teach them stuff that has immediate application because a lot of things in school, in homeschool in general, are you're going to need this, you know, like in right. the future. Yes, you know, this is, we need like, dinner tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah you know, and, and there's a lot more satisfaction towards doing something that gives you that immediate feedback of, you know, oh, everybody loved what I made versus, hey, did you know that I can divide fractions now? Like, right. Because someday I'm going to have to try that whenever I'm doing something. I don't know. (laughs) My kids are always asking me that. When are I going to need this for? I'm like, trust me, sometimes you will. Oh gosh. We had one of those moments where we actually, my kids actually needed to apply their math and it worked and they did it right. And it it was just, Uh it was and they're like, oh, one of those Mom, full circle is this moments. what you meant? I'm like, yes, this is yeah. what I meant. <laughs> yes. So let's talk about the kitchen and winter and cooking and some of our favorite things to make. I know a lot of people just want inspiration and that cozy feeling. I feel like my favorite time of year in the kitchen is winter. It's probably one of the only things I like about winter, which is why I invited you on. Yeah, what are you making? I think we could even probably touch on venison because. I have a freezer full of elk and deer because I have a family of hunters. I don't personally hunt. Well, everything, I mean, our, probably our main staple is sourdough. And I do that, Mm -hmm. you know, I do four loaves every, um, every time I make it and I make it three times a week or so. So I'm making a lot of sourdough every week and that's kind of one of our, you know, it goes with everything. So, right, um, it does. And as far as venison goes, I think we've had, this week has been entirely game meat. Actually, I think the last two weeks have been entirely game meat that we've gotten either this year or last night. We, My son, so uh, he's been really into learning how to hunt. He's eight. And so I've been doing a lot of mentor hunting with him. And he got two squirrels this last week. So uh, we processed out the squirrels oh, and slow cooked them. My son would love you. 
<laughs> he always wants to shoot squirrels. And I'm like, I don't know how to process squirrels. Can we not? You know, they're, they're hard because they're, there's not yeah. a whole lot of meat on them. And so, you right. know, when you have a large family like ours, then it takes more than one to eat it to, to feed everybody. And honestly, I feel like squirrels are only worth their time. In my opinion, there are a lot of people who disagree with me for young hunters because just there's just not experience. enough meat and like I hate cleaning squirrels there's not much I can do with the hide because they're not very big so I am going to tan the hide that he got on his last squirrel because he got it completely on his own but anyway we slow cooked the squirrels all day and made a squirrel alfredo with them because if you're not if you're kind of new to eating um different kinds of meat you know then it's always best to kind of disguise it in something that you already eat um, so for mm -hmm, example, yeah. uh, my husband wasn't a big fan of eating organ meat. Um, and so when I cook like deer heart and stuff, I'll usually chop it up super fine and saute that and add it into chili or something, you know, where it's already, it's in something we're already used to, you know, and you don't notice the difference in texture. I have no problem with eating heart. My kids are all used to it by now, but, um, mm -hmm. there are, I mean, I've, I've noticed this because I, in casual conversation, you know, we'll talk about <laughs> different things, like what we're eating. And then I notice like everybody else is quiet. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and they're like, you eat deer heart? And I'm like, it's, it, oh, it's man. just meat. It's not like. Well, I've had beef heart and I can, I can vouch for that. It actually is a really good cut of meat. I don't know why we don't eat it. it it's really funny too, because we instantly get grossed out, but we eat like the cow's butt and call it a delicacy. And the heart is just gross. Well, I just, like, it's really weird. I mean, taking it even like a step farther, like we eat meat that we have no idea where it came from. We have no idea how exactly. it was raised. I go, I go on this all the time because I have a dairy cow and people are like, you drink it raw. I'm, you go to the store and just buy it randomly off the shelves. I mean, you know, not that that's bad, but I'm just saying if it's gross for me to go out and get it from a source that I recognize and then drink it, then yours is also gross. Um, everybody, I mean, you know, you hear arguments from people all the time be like, well, I'm not a person of faith. And it's like, well, if you're eating food from a grocery store, you are a person of blind faith because you believe you are that everything <laughs> yeah. here is meant to benefit you and not mm -hmm. just to make yeah. money for large corporations. So anyway, right. Yep. You're very, uh, yeah, that's, a um, I, we could have a lot of episodes, Melody. <laughs> <laughs> well, but okay. So the other day I was reading about what is the mystery meat that makes up McDonald's chicken nuggets. Right. And then I was mm. thinking how many people wouldn't blink an eye about taking a bite out of that. And yet if I were to serve them up a piece of sauteed squirrel, they'd be like, I'm not eating that. Like this yes, squirrel, one hundred percent. Squirrel yep. lived a very clean life. It was as organic as you can get, <laughs> you know. And it was um, treated well. It was not made. You know, it wasn't cramped. It wasn't given wasn't anything given. it didn't want. It literally yeah. foraged for its food, and yeah, yeah. And it was, you know, it was happy right up until the end, <laughs> and then it had a quick death. So, I. It, that always, and I just had this un conversation on Sunday when I was talking about how, so we were planning on turning squirrel into pot pie because that's another one of okay. our ways that you can, you can utilize yeah. a lot of different Those kinds eat. of meat. Um, and, yeah. um, my friend Erin is like the queen of pot pies and now she's got me really hooked on it. So, um, me, I'm Those so are, hooked in the winter on pot pies. So hooked. Yeah. We have them like pot pies are the best. <laughs> um, <laughs> But anyway, we we're going to do that. And then um, as I was talking to my friends at church, they're all like, why, why would you do that? So anyway, it just, it does kind of bother me that people, they don't understand the necessity of using everything. And so like, if I'm going to shoot a deer, so long as I didn't shoot it, you know, in the heart, which that happens, right. but, um, and we're going to utilize the heart because it is a great, you know, it's just another muscle. Um, you just have mm -hmm. to know how to, how to process it the right way. Um, but that doesn't have much to do with hearty winter food. Well, I mean, hearty, I guess. Technically. Well, it kind of does actually, because I, I love stews and all of those hearty foods. And you were talking about bread. I make bread. I t find myself making it less in the summer because it's so hot. My oven, it, it's a vintage oven and it really heats up the kitchen. And so I don't mind having it going all winter long, but in the summer I like to do like skillet breads, like a flat bread or a tortilla. A little bit more often and then also 
bone broths and hearty stews. I feel like that heart would be really good for that. So, I mean, I'm not, I'm not against talking about organ meats at all. Well, I'm so to, because of the Homestead Mamas group, I got connected with a lot of other um, moms that are part of the regular like contributors to Homestead Mamas. And we just we've been kind of doing like an organ challenge. So this week, I think two of them have had pig heart for dinner. And um, we just kind of, you know, basically our goal is normalize the way we should be eating, not the way that we're mm-hmm. used to eating, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, because we have to understand like that the mindset that we have around food by and large, like not every single person, but in the general population, the mindset we have towards food is complete consumerism. It's how can we get the most for the cheapest price and how can we feed the masses, you know, and, and that doesn't really lend itself to good nutrition or good practices because it wasn't meant to be that way, you know? Food now, it just, it isn't what it used to be. And I think that starting in the kitchen, starting with food, starting with bread and hunting your meat or raising your meat is like the best way to start changing the mindset and the lifestyle of like a generation that basically lives with a disposable mindset. Like pretty much everything is disposable. Like even you get a brand new iPhone, it's going to be obsolete in two years and you have to get a new one because everything Mm -hmm, is made to be consumed and discarded. And I don't, I right. don't want to perpetuate that, you know? So I, I truly think it starts in the kitchen. And there's so much meaning to doing, learning skills that will literally sustain your life. We could definitely just go buy this, the food from the grocery store. There is no point in me going out and milking my cow every day or raising a garden or going hunting. You can definitely just go buy meat at the store. But learning those skills, they could be practical someday, honestly. They, they really could. But they also just putting your hand to something that sustains life is something that we were meant to do. And so we we find a certain joy and fulfillment in it that people might not necessarily realize is going to happen whenever you embark on things like that. Because monetarily, even my husband and I were trying to figure up like what we pay per gallon for our raw milk. And we're like, well, we just could go ahead and buy it. But I just love that aspect of going out and getting it and then also teaching the kids the same skills. You were talking about using the whole animal. I recently was sharing on my YouTube channel how I buy bags of chicken feet to put in my broth because it makes the most gelatinous broth. And I actually, people were pretty receptive to the whole idea, surprisingly. I can't imagine what my husband would do if he walked in and saw a pot of chicken feet. Chicken feet broth. <laughs> yeah, you take off the lid and sure yeah. enough, it's a pot already- of chicken feet. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> he already, whenever he sees me making broth, he's like, I just picture you over a cauldron. Yeah. Like, you know, like this is your wish yeah, is true. Like <laughs> a potion. Like it, but he, he appreciates it. It just, um, you know, it is, it is a changing of that mindset that you were raised with, you know? So yeah, chicken's feet, it is kind of gross if you think about it, but <laughs> I mean, it's like I said, it's just meat. You yeah. Know? It's all Have gross you if had, you really like, think about it. People- <laughs> Yeah, just like Jello. I mean, people eat red Jello yeah. all the time. Like, where does Jello come from? You guys know from? where that comes from. Yes. <laughs> or yeah. like, if you eat cheese, you know, and 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 rennet, you know, like most mm-hmm. people don't yeah. think about all of that. But no, it's just because, because we so don't have to from the process. Yeah, I was gonna say we don't have to face the process. Since we don't have to face the process, you're you get the luxury of being far removed from it. I find it really interesting when some of the homestead moms that I know on Instagram share like the butchering process and like harvest day, the, the feedback they get. And I'm thinking, do these people ever eat meat? Because I mean, hopefully you're not just okay with buying meat from the store, but not okay with facing it. And that's again, totally off topic, but I find that really interesting that we can be okay with meat as long as we're buying it, but not okay. If we have to see it happen, should be okay with it all or not at all. I I, mean, I totally agree. And that's one of the reasons that I hunt and that my kids are a part of every part of that process from preparing to going out in the field to helping process the animal and everything. Because we've had a lot of talks about, you know, I don't hunt because I hate animals. Like I actually love animals, you know, probably opposite um, of that. And, yeah. Yeah. And I just I want to be a responsible steward of what it is that I've been given, you know, and I've mm-hmm. been given children 
you know, I've been given this life and I, I, I want to use it well. And I think one of the ways doing that is giving myself good nutrition, but also utilizing the resources that are around me to the best extent that I can. And I think, you know, hunting is such a, it, it's really needed because, um, I mean, I don't know if you want me to go down this, this road or not. I, I don't care. But, this is great. <laughs> okay. You know, because, because we have come into, into land that has been occupied by animals, um, you know, for forever, like we're encroaching on a territory that it messes up the homeostasis of the environment. You know, we have what can survive here is, is you know, a lot of predators can survive because they can eat all these small prey animals, but the deer are going to, if their population isn't managed, they're going to get hit by more cars. They're going to starve in the winter. They're going to have disease run rampant, you know? And so because we've encroached on this environment, which is, which is fine. It's our, you know, it's our right as the higher order beings to do, but because we've done it, like we need to manage it well and allowing an unchecked population of animals that's going to be to their detriment is just, it's not responsible. And so from a conservation standpoint, I really believe hunting is beneficial, but also as a human, you know, we've kind of been taught easier is better. Mm -hmm. You know, everything is touted as like, what is, you know, it'll make things easier. Like this new gadget will make it easier. But what we've learned, I think collectively as homeschoolers, as homesteaders or whatever, is that easier isn't always better. Actually, easier doesn't make us better people usually. Easier just gets the job done faster, but with zero refining in the process. And so... Anyway, all that to say, I could easily go buy a roast at the store. I would much rather go spend weeks in the woods, learning what I can from nature, having my children see my dedication and my hard work, and just having that stillness and that time to myself. It's a great, it's a wonderful time. I love spending that quiet time out in nature and then bringing that meat back and having the the gift of getting to see the joy on my children's faces when I come back successful, you know, things like that. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. And then getting to learn how to use every part of the animal. Are you using the bones from deer to make bone broth? As a base I form? have not been. And the reason that I don't is because I, I'm i wary of using bone broth from animals that are um, foraging. Okay. Um, it It can totally be done. And I know plenty of people who do it. I just, I, I don't know enough about that yet. And I know I've talked, I've spoken to some of the farmers around here that they do use certain herbicides and GMOs in their fields. Right. And so I know these deer are eating that corn and that soy. And so while it is as natural and free range as, you know, deer are going to get, mm-hmm. because I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure about it. I don't at this point. Okay. Um, you yeah, know, cause that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but I do. Um, so we raise golden retriever hunting dogs. And all the bones go to our dogs. And, oh, okay. yeah. you know, that's nothing, nothing goes to waste with that. Right. And like right yeah. now I have a deer, I have a deer hide that's waiting to be tanned. Um, I was just waiting until it gets warm enough that I can soak it. And then we'll use a pressure washer to get the, to flush the hide out. Um, but it's been like a long stretch of negative double digits for us. Oh my! And <laughs> today is our first day. We've been above zero in a while, so you will find me a very a much a wimp washer at negative twenty. No, no. Um, I'm obviously a wimp for not enjoying winter because I don't think we've ever got below zero this whole year. And when we do, it's a really big deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have a lot of good friends yeah. in Missouri, and. Um, they're always like, yeah, it's totally not bad. here. Yeah. They're always cracking up when I'm like, talking to them about Marco Polo and I've got like a fur hat on and fur boots and like, you know, I'm just covered head to toe, but it's, it is so cold. And that's one of the biggest things that I teach in survival class about winter is you are going to hate winter and probably not survive winter if you go out and you're not prepared for it. Winter, like, being out in right. the cold, especially being out in the woods in the cold, is a really amazing experience because there's not a lot of underbrush. Animals mm-hmm. can't hide in the same way. But right. they're still my husband always says winter's his favorite season because he he loves hiking and the the only time he can really do it's the winter. And it's it's beautiful, but like if you're not wearing the right gear, you're gonna be miserable. But the right the right gear makes all the yeah. difference. And like being able to be warm and understanding things like one of the things I teach in my survival classes 
you know, you never sit on the snow. You always, if it's sticks, if it's leaves, whatever it is, you always put a barrier between you and the snow because that's the way you're going to lose heat the fastest. And, um, you know, understanding yeah. little things right. like that really helps make the whole process so much more enjoyable. So what are your, some of your favorite, we can skip to this, but I actually want to come back to sourdough at some point. Um, what are some of your favorite outdoor activities? You mentioned survival classes. Is that something that you do locally or do you offer that online too? No. And I don't like, I did it a lot last year. This year I haven't gotten to do very much with it. Um, cause we just, we had a really crazy fall and I kept on planning on doing it, but, um, I, it just, it never worked out. So I'll probably start doing those again. I just do it for homeschool kids in the area. And then okay. pretty much whoever. Oh, I wish we had that. That'd be so cool. If anybody asks, then I'm like, sure, you know, I'll, I'll happily share it with anybody, but I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't really feel comfortable like putting things out there for people online and then being like, you know, now go survive. <laughs> like, you know, there's, well, that's true. There's, there's, yeah. enough, <laughs> there's stuff you've got to learn that you just, you learn by being there, you know? Um, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. everything from, from building a shelter, you know, like we can all watch a survival show online and be like, Oh, I could do that. You know, but it's inevitably mm-hmm. you make mistakes when you go in the woods and those mistakes are like some of the best teachers, but having somebody who can coach you through them is really helpful. Yeah. So I yeah. do, I do a class with homeschoolers. So, and one of the things we focus on is how, how science and nature intertwine with different survival skills. And like one of the things that I'm really big on is not using gadgets because I think that every advent of a new gadget, whether it's a GPS or matches or a lighter, any of those things, they nullify the skills that our ancestors relied on, you know? And so like, if, if you are used to driving, listening to a voice that tells you every turn you have to make and warns you before the turn even comes that it's coming, your brain is completely (laughs) shut off to navigation. You don't need to know what direction is East, what direction is North. You know, right. and so one of the things that I really harp on with students is always being acclimated to your environment. Always figure out where's north. You know, it's an easy one to know, but just having this awareness, like as you're driving, what direction are you driving? You know, don't wait for the voice to tell you, like figure these things out because it's a really, you never know when the map isn't going to be there, when the GPS isn't going to be there. And understanding that nature has inside of nature or is pretty much everything that we need to understand navigation and survival and all that stuff. We just have to know how to unlock it. And if you're always using gadgets, you're never going to need to unlock it. So that's a big deal to me. Right. So do you take the kids out in the woods often? My kids? Yes. Um, All the time. Yeah. And one of our favorite things to do in the winter is to go find a new spot on our land. So we live in Minnesota in the bluff country. Um, and we're not okay. far from the Mississippi River, and so everything is is big bluffs and hills and deep timber. We have oaks and a okay. lot of paper birch, um, and so it's and cedar trees and evergreen trees. So it's really great topography for kind of always having to deal with a new situation, you know. So whether we're on the flats or whether we're up on a hillside or whatever, um, and. Uh, we like to go out and I have my kids pick a spot, you know, like this is where find a spot where we're going to be able to build a fire and cook our lunch. And we'll, it, it, it's oh, fun awesome. in the snow. We just did this last Thursday in the snow. Um, and it was really cold, but we did it anyway. We have a few spots where we already have shelters built on our land so we can go there and the little ones can hang out in the shelter. We'll bring a blanket for them. And then the big ones have to work on gathering all the materials they need for a fire. And then we always have to spark a fire with a ferro rod um, you know, so then it's, it's lit by sparks. It's not a match. It's not a lighter, you know, it's mm-hmm. the old way of doing it. And I haven't started them on friction fires yet with like a, you know, where you'd use a, a bow, um, with a drill. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but, um, no, okay. There's, there's <laughs> a, cool though. the next level of fire making would be friction fires. Uh, ferro rod is, is still, okay. I mean, it's a challenge, but it's a lot easier than a, than a friction fire. So Okay. They have to be responsible for gathering all of everything we need for starting this fire. And one of the things that I've noticed in the older ones, as we've continued to do this, is as we're walking, I can see them stuffing their pockets with the different things that they, they see that we'll need. You know, because if we walk by a cedar mm-hmm. tree, well, they can scrape off some of the cedar bark because it makes a great catch for sparks. 
you know, and the last time we did this is the first time that this happened is they emptied out their pockets. They had talked beforehand to each other about gathering what they needed on the way. And then they were able to sit down. One of them went over and took over um, gathering all of the tinder together and making a nest and working on, on all of that. One of them got kindling and one of them got firewood. And I just sat back and watched. They're eight, nine, and 11. And they did everything. <laughs> and then wow. I just hung out with the little kids. And then we bought, we have some, I love cooking over a fire, but sometimes we just do um, the like freeze dried packaged meals. And so I had some of these that they really, really wanted to try where you just add water and there's a heating element in it and it heats steams in the bag and then you can open it up and just eat it like that. And they love those. So, um, yeah, yeah, so we did, (laughs) we did those the other day and it was just, it's, um, it's a really cool experience for me to see them take all of that because I know they're doing stuff most adults don't know how to do. Oh yeah. No, your kids would out survive me for sure. (laughs) I love the idea of spending out like all of winter outside. This is something I've seriously only just come to a revelation about in the last like three years where I'm like, you know what, guys, we are going to be outside like it's warm every single day. And here compared to where you live, it it is warm, <laughs> but we've been just spending hours outside every day when I feel like we used to think winter is when you're in just day after day for months. And I'm not willing to accept that anymore because we need outside time. And there's, there's really no excuse for it. Like you said, if you're prepared and you have the right gear for it, even you up in Minnesota can be outside most of the winter. Do you have like a cutoff? Well, I don't let my little kids outside. It's negative. Like, okay. So we have, um, my, Middle two, Jonah and Isla, they're eight and nine. They have a snare line set up for rabbits, and they have to check the snares every day um, because we're not going to let a snare go, let a rabbit go to the coyotes. Um, And, you know, so whether it's negative 12 outside or plus five degrees, there's, they have to go check their snares. We have animals. Right. So they have to, we have to be out feeding the animals. But I pretty much cut right. them off at negative five degrees. Like if it's colder than that, you walk outside and like if your eyes are watering, like it freezes on your face. Like you don't, you know, <laughs> and so, and I do have, Ugh. I do have quite a few rules about where they can go. They have to be wearing a blaze orange hat or blaze pink hat so that I can always see because it can be really dangerous to be in the cold. Like if it's anything like you just, you fall and you hurt yourself and you're out there too long and it's you know ne- you're just kind of stuck it's negative there. 15 degrees like you're gonna get in a world of trouble real fast you know so we do have a cutoff but we have a pole shed and in there we have an archery range they can rollerblade they can scooter so even if it's too cold to be outside our, we have a heated shed and they can get their energy out that way so that's nice yeah setting the place up for that we've been doing that too our our temperatures are so much different than yours. It's kind of unbelievable. We have, I would say our average January day is 30. And so we can be outside all the time. See, we are in a heat <laughs> but wave we've been setting up our today. Yeah. Yeah. We, we're actually in a heat wave too. So my husband took all the other kids on a hike today because it's, I don't know, it's probably 40 and sunny today, which is just, it, you might as well be wearing a hoodie. It's really nice. But we have our barn set up to where we have, like, we're doing a gym upstairs in the loft of the barn with a ping pong table and a climbing wall and rings and all that because they need places to run. And if it's too cold, which it very rarely is, that's more than good. It's not heated, though. So pretty much it has to still be nice out for them to go in there. But well, that's gathering from you, I think it's nice here pretty much all winter. <laughs> Comparatively. <laughs> but... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah. So basically our cutoff is if it's dangerously cold, it's 30 degrees. Like it is to, mm-hmm. oh, so much, so nice. Plus, you know, we have the benefit. Yeah. I don't know. I don't think you guys have snow down there. Do you? We, we do, but we don't get like you, we haven't had any snow this whole season yet. We'll, we'll get some, we'll get a couple of big snows and then that'll be it. Yeah. So I think it makes a big, big difference having snow in the winter. Um, you know, going outside mm-hmm. when it's just cold, but there's no snow kind of right. is 
I'm yeah. just kind of annoying, you know? And so we have a nice, That's we have true. a nice base layer of snow. And then oh, another big world of opportunities opens up, you know, building snow forts and yeah. um, we do a lot of skiing That's and true. snowboarding. Yeah. And, um, we live, we live only like two or three miles away from a big ski area. Cause like I said, we live in the bluff country. So, oh, wow. um, we don't, yeah. we don't have a season pass there yet. We haven't ever done that, but we're thinking as our kids get older, you know, more chances to be outside in the winter. So maybe we're going to do that. Yeah. And okay. So going to, uh, preparing for winter, I know we had talked about talking about that. So if you want to go into that, that's a, a little bit to do with yes. the shed. Um, yeah. Because we're able to have a heated yeah. coal shed because we heat exclusively with wood. Um, and so we have, okay. we have a wood boiler. And when we had, when we moved to this property, there was no outbuilding. So we just built the shed and, um, we ran water lines oh, wow. over there from the boiler and we're able to heat the shed and the house and all of our hot water with one wood boiler. Um, and our, so our big preparation wow. for winter is just, you know, chopping wood, cutting wood. And that is something wood. all mm-hmm. of the kids are helping, uh, helping with. So, um, well, not the not the littlest kids. The oldest three help with it. From right. you know, we have to stack the yeah. wood. You know, cut the wood, stack the wood. My father in law is an arborist, so that uh, helps a lot because when he cuts down hardwood trees, he'll just come and drop them on our property, and then we can just cut them up from there. And you know, not have we're not out searching for wood ever. And we have you know oak hardwood forests, so it's all right outside our door anyway. Um, but I'd say mm-hmm. as far as preparing for winter, that's one of the biggest ones. And then also having, preparing water for the winter. Like, I think one of the most annoying things about living in Minnesota and having animals is that from October Mm -hmm. until, like, April, water is frozen, (laughs) you know? Right. And And it's so annoying. And it's also annoying because, like, if if the heaters get unplugged for, you know, half hour, things get frozen. For us, it's like we have to check for eggs every hour or two because if if they're out there any oh, length of time, they freeze. Yeah, and um, yeah, and then we also we're really selective about the chickens that we buy um, to make sure that they have a rose comb or a really small comb because we've had a lot of chickens that have had their comb self amputate from getting frostbite. So mm-hmm. we've had that even here. So I can imagine that it would definitely happen where you live. Yeah, so I guess there's just everything has to be when you live in a in an area that gets really cold. There has to be a lot of intentionality behind everything, preparing for winter, um, choosing what animals, choosing what breeds, all of that. Do you do any preparations for enjoying winter, like maybe certain craft supplies on hand? I saw that you like to carve. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so and that seemed like a cool... wood carving isn't. So my husband does a lot of work on the lathe. And I like to do a lot of wood carving. I, I do lathe work as well, but mostly I like to make things like rolling pins and candlesticks. Like I'm not super artsy about it. You know, he's making bowls and pepper mills and really cool stuff. Um, oh, wow. And so we have, that's one yeah. of the things in the woodshed, we have it set up as we have a wood shop, we have our archery range. And so like a big part of preparing for winter, when we are cutting wood, we always leave out pieces that are potential wood uh, lathe pieces or good for carving. And, okay. um, and then that, you know, that keeps it cause it has to dry a certain amount, you know, and stuff like that. Um, and so pretty much everything that we make is, is from the wood pile. Um, and then right now we're in this like glorious lull of winter because there's this really big push for us. We really like to do handmade gifts for Christmas. And so I feel like mm-hmm. after, our year basically goes, the middle of September is the start of archery deer season. So from the middle of September until the middle of November, every free time I get, I'm out hunting. And then right. um, anytime I'm not hunting, I'm preserving. <laughs> and anytime I'm not doing that, I'm trying to homeschool the children. And we go fairly right. light on homeschool in the fall because we know <laughs> winter is coming and on those negative yeah. 10 degree days, we push out as much school as we can. Um, yeah. And I do like, you know, when the weather's nice, I want them to be able to be outside. I don't, I don't want them to be stuck at the table doing work, you know, when I know what's coming with winter. Um, yes, yes, exactly. And um, so we kind of save like the bulk of our big work for these really cold months. 
But at, once mid-November hits, you know, the height of deer season is really slowed down. And um, and then it's just, it's make, make everything, make the presents. Making for Christmas. Yeah. And then, mm-hmm. and it just, it does get a little hectic and get to a point where it's like, I just get sick of it. Um, and then after Christmas, it's just like this, we're in that glorious time right now where it's like, we have free time. Yeah. Nothing's really expected of yeah. you. Yeah. The weather's not necessarily going to let you just do anything with the homestead really. Yeah. And we have, I mean, in the summer, I do not have a prayer of being caught up on laundry, but like right now yeah, we're caught up on laundry, <laughs> you know, and, yeah. <laughs> um, we can, when we have a lull in our day, like right, what we're doing right now, like, well, normally we'd be doing a game with the kids. We do a lot of games mm-hmm. and my kids can probably beat most adults at strategy games because I love to play strategy games. And so that's one of the things that we do together. Um, and in the winter, yeah, yeah. And it's so much fun to have. And that's how I was raised. I was homeschooled and out on a, on a homestead okay. out in Wisconsin Yeah, you seem like a homeschooler. (laughs) I get (laughs) that a lot. (laughs) Yeah. And it's a compliment. From some people. (laughs) Yeah. When it's from my husband, it's no, you sound like such a homeschooler. (laughs) Right, right. Yeah. I get it. (laughs) um, Yeah. So uh, when we get to the time we're in now, like our big thing in the afternoon is my kids really want to learn how to play chess well. So we do chess lessons in the afternoon. And we really buckle down on music lessons and everything like that. So this is like one of my favorite times of year. And it just like, it just makes me happy. Also, I think a lot of people um, go into winter expecting their schedules to be similar to summer. But naturally, like Mm -hmm. our bodies aren't, aren't made for that. Like there's so much dark in the winter, you know, that when, when natural Mm -hmm, daylight decreases, uh, serotonin levels in our body decrease and melatonin levels go up. You know, and even the cold can um, signal our bodies to release more melatonin. And so that's one of the reasons, like, people just, you can get more sleepy. But also, sleep is one of the best medicines. So when it's cold and flu season and everything like that, the ability to sleep more because it's dark more is a gift. Like, we should be utilizing that. And so um, my husband and I, like, we usually are in bed by 8.30, 9 o'clock at the latest. And, you know, and I'm usually up by 6.20. Mm-hmm. He's up at 5.45. And, um, that amount of sleep in the winter, I think, I think a lot of people disregard the natural health benefit of just getting enough sleep. And I look at this time of year as like, this is my time to catch up on that. I'm not doing a bonfire in the evenings. You know, I'm not doing all these things. It's not light until nine o'clock at night. And I'm wanting to stay up because I want to go to bed when it's dark. It's like, take our cues from nature. It's a shorter Mm -hmm. light time it's a longer dark time, sleep more. And that's another... Yeah. I mean, it does just kind of happen naturally because it it's a little boring. You're just inside and there's it's dark. There's not really... You can play board games, but then it's still, it's only seven o'clock and... Yeah. I mean, do you guys ever experience where yeah. it's like you finish dinner and you're like, oh my gosh, it's not bedtime yet? Like, you know, yes, it's like it's all the time. Thirty. these kids need to go to bed. And so... Mm-hmm. We've just kind of decided that we need to let the our circadian rhythm dictate how we sleep and not necessarily the clock dictate how we sleep because mm-hmm. um, yeah, being bound to a clock is really kind of arbitrary unless it's like for a work schedule, right? If your kid is tired at 6.30, right. let them go to sleep at 6.30. In my experience, I've let my kids fall asleep early like that and they still sleep to the same time, you know, and they don't understand. Oh, yeah the Mm -hmm. hormone balances and stuff and why they're wanting to sleep more, but it, it it just, it eventually works out. Um, and I think, I think it's really, really beneficial. And another thing that I like to do this time of year is I only eat when it's light because I feel like it's another part of nature. Um, just kind of giving me cues, you know, and like, that's, that's how it would have been done probably, um, you know, in the, in the more old days, like when you were, having to fetch the water and having to make different things like that and and not wanting to do everything in the dark, you know? And I've just found like, it just, I feel like it helps me stay healthier to just kind of take the cues from nature. And that's really such a beautiful part about winter too, especially with the evenings. And I have to remember that because in the summer I'm thinking, why are the kids still wide awake when it's nine o'clock? 
and I'm almost longing for winter. But then during winter, I'm like, remember when it was light till nine (laughs) o'clock? Just, I don't know. Do you feel like it takes a little bit of intentionality to enjoy it? Getting bundled up to go outside, making foods that are cozy, maybe lighting a candle or investing in lighting like lamps and things that make the home just a little bit cozier because otherwise it can get a little bit depressing. But getting outside each day is such an obvious choice for everybody. But you did mention something in there that I have to comment on, and that is that getting children bundled up and ready to go outside is literally the bane of my existence. Like, oh, I under, yeah, it's, it's because inevitably (laughs) as you're like tucking the last hand inside a glove, somebody has to go potty and somebody needs this Mm -hmm. or that. So yeah, it's, that part is not enjoyable, but if you have little kids, brighter days are coming when your kids are old enough that what they will know how to bundle themselves up and go outside. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. That it takes just enough effort to wear. Sometimes you think it's really not worth it, but then once you're outside, it it definitely is to get the sunshine. You don't have to be stuck in your house for three months straight. It's, it is worth it. I have, yeah, it's also the bane of my existence because, oh man, stuff's just everywhere. None of us are very organized people. We have, we have rules about winter gear because it, you you know, you need so much of it. And that is, we have a front door where everybody comes in and out and then the back door that uh, walk out basement and everybody's allowed one pair of boots, one hat and one jacket upstairs. Everything else has to be downstairs. And it drives my kids nuts sometimes, you know, they want to be able to just get everything and go outside, but throw it on. Yeah. 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 I can't, I can't live with clutter. That's another thing. We have 1100 square feet and seven people. So Mm -hmm. we need, um, keeping things tidy is really important. And gosh, my kids today, like, like I said, right. We're in a really good, like little lull of winter and my kids are feeling it because, um, when I told them it was time for our 10 minute cleanup, which is just, we do it like three or four times a day. Um, they immediately, they just went and got everything and tidied up. And like my six year old, her job is always wash, trim, wash door handles, wash the walls where people touch. And she got done today. And she's like, is there anything more you can wash? Like, she's just like this little energizer. <laughs> and so I think also another like survival mechanism in winter is giving kids a sense of purpose daily you know, they have responsibility and, and it's a really great time to hone in on homemaking skills and things that, um, they're too busy for in the summer. You know, I don't want to stay inside and wash mm-hmm. the trim in the summer. I want to be outside, you know? And so we're going to, we we focus right. on a lot more of those skills or things like teaching them to knit or crochet or carve or any of those yeah. things. Like I don't have the patience for it in summer because I have too many other places to be and things to do with that are, you know, largely homestead related. So it's, I don't want people to miss the opportunity to use the stillness and the downtimes and like this, like opportunistic quiet, you know, of winter and fill it up with things like, and and I'm not going to say these things are bad, but, you know, not just fill it up with busyness. Because like, Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of people fill their winters with, they have to be here for this sport and that sport and this event and that event. And it's like, you just kind of miss some of the beauty of it when you spend this season that allows you to reset just being busy, you know? Oh, one of the things somebody told me a few years ago was to beware the barrenness of a busy life. And it has played Mm -hmm. in my mind so many times. You know, I looked up... um, uh, when one of my friends passed away two years ago, I looked up what were what were the top five regrets of a dying person, and one of them was, "I wish I would have worked less and enjoyed more." And mm-hmm. you know, as a homesteader, like you can only work less sometimes, and this is one of those times for me. You know, and you take it, yeah, yeah. So take it, take the opportunity to um, to reset. Yeah. Well, that was all said beautifully. I knew you were the right person for the winter episode. I could just tell from your your whole page. This girl actually is enjoying winter. I can tell. Oh, I feel like we could talk about this forever. I wanted to ask you about your sourdough, what recipes you use. Um, we can close there because I feel like, like I said, we could just chat forever about winter and the beauty and stillness of it. But 
So what are some of your favorite sourdough recipes? It's a beautiful time to experiment with all that. Well, I I have zero recipes that I follow. I'm very much a, let's try to do it. You know, I'm going to try this, try that. Yeah. And because I just wrote a sourdough booklet um, with instructions and a recipe in it, I was forced oh, okay. to measure this yes. this fall. <laughs> like, and I'm, it was yeah. so tedious, you know, having to measure every time mm-hmm. I made sourdough so that I could replicate every time and, and have to test my recipe. So I have one, one recipe that I've produced that is just your basic, I call it just your everyday right. sourdough because, you know, I can put okay. it in a loaf, I can make it into a bowl, I can make it into a batard, it doesn't really matter. Um, and that is the only one that I've like solidified. Everything else is just, I am so like, I hate following recipes cause I'm pretty sure I could do it better if I just tried on my own. Yep. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. So I've learned a lot of things through trial and error. I love, um, doing braided enriched doughs like, um, like Mm, Chala or, um, I love doing coated bread, like, um, the poppy seed coated. Um, so I just Mm -hmm. made another one of those today. And with that, all I do is my regular, oftentimes I'll just do my regular sandwich loaf. Although it's really, really good if you add in sharp cheddar with the poppy seed, like the flavor, oh. it just goes so well together. But on top um, of it, kind of like a bagel almost. No, no, no. Like into the dough. In the dough. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. And so okay. I, um, I love doing that. And then, um, I, one of my like favorite ways to kind of dress up sourdough is to make my normal, I'll make the normal levain. And then right before, like when, as I'm mixing in the flour, I'll add, I'll, I'll, uh, add cocoa powder. And then it does mess up the hydration a little bit. So you do have to mess a little bit with, um, with flour, you know, and because Mm -hmm. I'm always using different, different flour, um, with different hydration levels, I'm kind of experimenting with different, um, water all the time, like how much water I'm putting in to get the right consistency. But that's just kind of something I think as you do it more, you get to know, this is the right feel. This is the right stretch. Um, and so I'll, I'll add cocoa. And then when I get to what, pretty much my final stretch and folds, I'll add cranberries also. And then um, okay. it's sourdough noir. So it turns out just this rich, dark, chocolatey looking, but it's not sweet. It doesn't taste like chocolate. It's got just this really earthy, um, almost like like a hint of molasses type. I don't know how to really describe it, but it is one of my favorite ways of doing sourdough, especially this time of year when it's just like, you know, I feel like food this time of year needs to be so savory. And yes, um, yes, I completely agree. Yeah. So doing that. And then I'll also, I'll take a, a, a batch of sourdough noir and a batch of regular, and I will twist them together and make it. So it's, um, it's just like a swirl of regular, dough with the sourdough Mm -hmm. noir and then add the cranberries into that. And, um, yeah, it's, it's really, really good. And it's really simple. So like with those kind of things, you can just, you take your basic recipe and you just think what stage of your sourdough process you, you would need to mix it in in order to get it to incorporate. Obviously if you're adding cocoa powder and you try to mix it on your last stretch and fold, it's not going to get fully incorporated, (laughs) you know? And that's yeah. one of my favorite things about sourdough is just finding a way to make it work because there's no, like, this is the oldest way of making bread in history. Obviously yeah. people have been doing trial and error with it forever. And so there's no, like, this is the only right way and all other ways are wrong. It's like you figure out what right. works for you making bread, you know? Mm-hmm. And I, I yeah. love that about sourdough. Oh yeah. This is such a good time to experiment with sourdough. I can tell because I have lots of sourdough recipes on my blog and this is when they get all of the hits is like January, February. People are really thinking about sourdough. Where can people find your booklet? Do you have that linked in your Instagram? No. So I just, I actually made it because I was going to a maker's market and I brought like packets of dehydrated sourdough and I wanted to have like a way to coach people through making it. And so I've, okay, I've had gotcha. a lot, I've had people reach out to me through Instagram and just ask if they can get it. And I will um, ship it out to people um, from there. If they just DM me, I will tell you, you know, like, this is how much I charge for it and ship it to you. And I do it one shipment a week. And I've been shipping, I don't know, anywhere, like three to 10 of them a week 
since the end of November um, because people are just, like you said, people are really wanting to get into sourdough right now. I have my basic, like, this is what I do. But if if ever anybody's like, I want to take a class or something, I always direct them to my friend Erin because she is, uh, so she's the Cedar Chest Farm on um, Instagram. But she's just a sourdough queen when it comes to teaching and classes and stuff. So it's like, if you get a starter from me, great, whatever. But if you really want to know how it's done with somebody who does recipes and measures and things like that, you might want to go to Erin. Mm-hmm. So. Okay. And you sell your dehydrated starter as well? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what I do is I actually got my starter from an ad in Mother Earth magazine like eight years ago. And um, okay. it was it was from this guy named Carl Griffith, who um, his goal was to keep the legacy of his family's sourdough alive. And he was like Mm. 80 something years old at the time. Um, But he would send you this little packet of dehydrated sourdough starter. And he included the history of it and like how it dated back to 1847, I think it was, that his family had brought it on the Oregon Trail. And so I include all of that history of what he sent to me with crediting his name because like I want, he, he passed away in 2008. And I think it's really cool to just kind of perpetuate that so people can know his story and his part in keeping this strain of sourdough going. Yeah. And, but it's also Mm -hmm. like this sourdough starter was used in, in Basque sheep camps baked in a hole in the ground. Like the sourdough starter was brought on the Oregon trail, (laughs) you know, and the names of the people who brought it and used it way back then are in the booklet because that's what he told me. And so I had to like go do quite a bit of digging to find like all of the information because at the time, you know, I didn't think, oh, I'm going to save this for everybody to use. And so I like, I read all the information. I thought it was super cool. And then I, you know, just lost it somewhere, but I was able to find it again online. And I, I think the history of it, I love the connectedness of not only is it making bread the same way that our ancestors made bread, but it's using right. the same starter, the same bacterial yeah. cultures that's become more and more vibrant over the years, over the last mm-hmm. almost 200 years. Right. Yeah. That is cool. That's awesome. So you do you have that, I guess, all linked in your bio over on Instagram that if people want to check it out, because I know people will, people love sourdough. Yeah. Well, if, um, if you want to see my step-by-step instructions and just kind of my sourdough troubleshooting, my uh, website, Renaissance Woman Minnesota, is is um, linked in my bio on Instagram. Okay. Otherwise, you can check out my story highlights. And I think on the highlights is where I give information about the sourdough packets or in my in my um, feed, there's the, the packet is in there. Or just send me a DM. DM, yeah. Um, cool. Yeah, because that's that's how I've been sending them out lately. Is just people find people find me through there, and then I just get a DM and I I send them out. So awesome! Oh my goodness, thank you so much for joining me. I feel like you were great, the perfect guest for this. So thank you so much well, for taking for time me. out of your day. All right. Well, I hope that you enjoyed this episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. Make sure to head over to RenaissanceWomanMN.com or at Renaissance woman.mn over on Instagram. Check out her sourdough resources. Maybe grab yourself a starter if you haven't yet made one for yourself and a lot of her cool ideas. I just loved the idea where she was talking about adding a little bit of cocoa and then braiding it together with the lighter dough to make this contrast. Such a cool idea. She is full of so many interesting ideas that honestly I've never really thought about before. If you like this episode, make sure to leave a review. I don't often ask, but that is really what helps this podcast to grow. So over on whichever platform you're on or an Apple, leave a five-star review. As always, thank you so much for listening and I'll see you in the next episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. Thank you.